It was the late 90s. My colleague and I drove out to the exurbs of Silicon Valley to learn about our research participants' smart home. The participants, and I'll call them John, told me that they homeschooled their kids. I was young and naive enough that I didn't have a clue as to what that typically signified in California in terms of religious affiliation and general orientation. When I asked why they made that choice, John snarled at me. He was far more interested in showing me the gear than talking about his family. But I explained to him that we were interested in learning about him as well. So he told me that they didn't support the local school system and its attitude towards alternative lifestyles. That's when I realized I was in an environment where their values were really different from my own. OK, no problem. That's par for the course for this job. So we spent a good long time after that checking out the details of this really incredible smart home the system that John had cobbled together. Yet there was this constant theme of monitoring and control, of, of using the technology to check up on the kids from other rooms. Still, it was, it was all good stuff. So as we're getting to the reflective part of the interview, wrapping up, or, or nearly so, John abruptly changes gears mid-explanation. John, of course, none of this really matters because it's all going to burn. My colleague and I were stunned and remained silent. John continued, and now I have a question for you fellows. Have you accepted Christ as your savior? This is the sort of question I'm utterly unprepared for. And in this interview, I knew it was coming. Some part of my body was tense right from the discussion for the rationale for homeschooling. And I knew it was going to emerge at some point. So while I was dreading it all along, perhaps it came as some kind of relief. Watching the video of the interview later, I saw the most deadpan version of myself I had ever seen. Well, perhaps that's a question best left for another time. So I was stuck. I couldn't dishonor all the rapport building and honest curiosity that I'd been exhibiting for the past two hours, but now we were trapped. My colleagues spluttered helplessly in an endless loop of reflecting back what John had said previously. So it sounds like you're saying, and I kept waiting for my opening for the, well, time to go. But John really wanted to talk to us about what we should be doing and thinking with respect to Christ. It seems this went on for a very long time, but we finally made it to the doorway. John asked us to wait and went off to get something. We should have made a break for it, but we were ensnared by the requirements of politeness in our researcher role. He returned with some Bible-related literature and exhorted us intensely to follow up. Another eternity, if you will, and we were finally able to step away. We made it to the car, drove one block, and then erupted in hysterical, gasping laughter. It was the laughter of relief, the kind of manic giggling you get from 10-year-olds who just got away from the angry shopkeeper. And we had some choice words about John once we were safe. This whole experience was terribly uncomfortable. I could not find a way to follow my own values as a researcher and still protect myself from a conversation that was personally risky. As a researcher, I was interested in and had respect for John's views on his family, his home, education, and the afterlife. But I didn't want to have to reveal my own beliefs or defend them, especially in this setting. I vividly remember the, time, uh, the first time that I sat in a hotel bar during a conference and I swapped stories with people about the bizarre, hilarious, and daunting things that had happened out in the field doing research. It felt good to discover that we'd had these similarly extreme experiences. And I realized at that point I was actually part of a community of practice. I didn't identify it this way at the time, but we were sharing war stories. Now, war story is a specific type of story. It's a personal story about how the storyteller themselves encountered a challenge. Unlike other forms of storytelling where you're meant to be inspired by how the storyteller overcame the challenge, in war stories, the storyteller doesn't necessarily prevail. I love this quote from Benet Brown from uh, her book, Rising Strong. We're wired for story. In a culture of scarcity and perfectionism, there's a surprisingly simple reason we want to own, integrate, and share our stories of struggle. We do this because we feel the most alive when we're connecting with others and being brave with our stories. Over the past few years, I've been gathering and publishing war stories by other user researchers. 
I've looked at these stories and pulled up some of the patterns and, th and themes, and, and I'm going to talk today about some of what we can learn from them. As Noah mentioned, this is my new book, Doorbell's Danger and Dead Batteries. It includes more than 60 stories from different researchers about the kinds of experiences they've had out in the field. If you want to learn more about user research, you can dig into my first book, Interviewing Users, and my podcast, Dollars to Donuts, where I interview people who lead user research in their organizations. These business books illustrate the notion of survivorship bias. And that's a cognitive bias where we focus on the people or things that survived some process, and we overlook those that did not. Sometimes what doesn't survive isn't visible, so you can't study it. But sometimes it's just that we choose not to look at it. Survivorship bias leads us to have overly optimistic beliefs about how the world works, because it means we don't include the complete set of data, which is both successes and failures. This type of thinking can lead to a false belief that a particular group of successes have a special property rather than, say, just coincidence. And culturally, we have a mindset, as you can see in these books, that says we should examine and emulate success in order for us to be successful. The fields of engineering and medicine have formally incorporated failure analysis into their practices. But if you look at design, user experience, research, and so on, we don't have that same appetite. And indeed, the reward structure in the cultures that many of us work in reward and encourage overconfident success stories rather than humility and reflection, which ironically are the very qualities that make for successful researchers. And the, we also are dealing with the fact that there's a strong demand for what are called clear and actionable insights. And so sometimes we choose to set aside these other stories because they're not considered as valuable. So let's look at a couple of areas that are particularly challenging and show up as patterns for user researchers. In linguistics, code switching refers to the typically unconscious practice of a speaker using multiple languages in a conversation. More popularly, we use this term to acknowledge the ways that different ethnic, racial, and cultural groups adjust their speech patterns, word choices, and mannerisms depending on who they're communicating with. On NPR's Code Switch blog, Gene Demby explains that code switching is about dialogue that spans cultures. We're hopscotching between different cultural and linguistic spaces and different parts of our own identities, sometimes within a single interaction. Code switching is an essential ingredient in research. Researchers themselves are not only code switchers, but they're also code breakers. And the work really goes beyond feature requests and preferences for one design over another. And what research reveals is its own form of code, the cultural code. Skilled researchers work hard to uncover and to decrypt these elusive codes. But sometimes there are cultural lines that we don't even learn about until we cross them. So even when researchers prepare as in-depth as possible to enter this new culture, they're unlikely to fully understand its rules and its norms before that immersion, before they immerse themselves in it. So once in the field, they must observe and then adapt themselves. So inevitably, researchers run into trouble when they uncover rules by bending them or breaking them. Researchers tend to talk about research as, as work that's about people and that success comes from building rapport with those people. But really, the truth is more complex. People are situated in a larger system, the environments, the culture. And some of the rules of those cultures are basic and transactional, how to get in, how to get out. But other rules are more nuanced, and they require the researcher to adapt. They require patience. They require creativity. In one war story, Eric Moses is so proud of using his iPad to take notes, he forgets that he's in a dark room where lab techs are developing the results of their experiments. In another story, John Innes is badged into a secure area, but leaves to find the bathroom and then is locked out without his phone or even the name of his contact. Greg Cabrero is embed embedded in Afghanistan as an anthropologist, and he starts taking notes uh, while observing a planning meeting. And this leads to a, a loud and awkward conflict with the sergeant major. Researchers eventually will crack the cultural code, but not before the culture itself has a crack at them. Here's a story from researcher David Horde. 
In 1995, I was on a 10-day trip to Tokyo to interview kids and young adults about their video game usage. I had done my best to read up on Japanese culture and manners. There's no way to learn a culture from a book or two. My goal was simply to avoid making a big mistake. I knew my two-handed business card presentation technique, and I nearly understood the rules for bowing. We'd been through most of the visits, and so far, so good. All the sessions had gone fairly well, and we were learning a lot. But then I did something bad, something wrong. We'd been visiting a house near the end of a train line, slightly out of the city center. The session was over. It was time to pack up the camera and notes and head out. We were doing our now normal goodbye ritual, trying to check off the right etiquette boxes. And then it happened. I misstepped. Near the front door, I placed my sock foot just off the wood floor and onto the carpet, with one shoe on already. Unknown to me, I just violated important etiquette about where you must be and must not be when putting your shoes back on when you leave. Instantly, the whole family erupted in hysterical laughter with everyone pointing at me. Confused, I did my best to get my shoes on as my Japanese colleague pulled me out the door and onto the street. She was like a commando extricating someone from an international hotspot. What was that, I asked once we were on the street. She informed me that laughter, apparently hysterical laughter, was how the Japanese coped with a faux pas or embarrassing situation. Embarrassment was indeed what I had created, and I felt it too. Intense embarrassment comes with a whole set of physical sensations. I was flushed, addled, and dazed. When we go out to do field research, we often feel we are going out to observe a strange species in its native habitat. We are the scientists, and they are the creatures to be documented. We go to great lengths to help them feel comfortable with our scientist-like presence. We feel like we are the smart ones. But guess what? The research participants are in their native habitat, and they are experts on their own lives. We, the researchers, are the weird aliens. We're the ones not getting the nuance. We're the ones who are sometimes worthy of mockery. But it's all in a day's work when you're out doing research. You've got to be light on your feet. Every research session I've been on has been a dance to cover the material, to sniff out insights that are right below the surface, all while you're trying to make everyone comfortable and keep the conversation flowing. It's the dance that makes it exciting. Just try to keep your toes in the right place. That's the end of David's story. And his story comes from a chapter about the cultural codes we encounter in new environments. So here's what we can learn from his story specifically, as well as some of the other stories that I've collected that involve new and challenging environments. Prepare for the experience of the interview. So just tactically reach out to whoever has granted you access in order to ask about logistics, dress code, or anything they think you might need to know before you get there. Consider your assumptions about the environment. Sure, you're prepared to forgo your assumptions about the participants, but don't forget the environment itself that your participant is in. Be present in your surroundings. A lot of interviewing, and this is very true for me, it happens in your head. But don't forget about the body. So you can remind yourself that you are physically in an environment by periodically noticing something about your body. Say, something like how your shirt feels against your arm or what position your foot is in. Keeping yourself grounded in your own body will help you be physically connected to the space that you are in. And it will support you in paying attention to the rules of the environment that, if necessary, making changes to how you're behaving to suit those rules. Include the rich data from the environment in your analysis. Cultural code can provide a great deal of context about why a participant behaves a certain way or expresses a certain point of view. And finally here, learn from your mistakes. And this phrase typically implies that you shouldn't mistake, make a mistake a second time. But in this context, the point here is that your mistakes and missteps are ways to surface the cultural rules that wouldn't otherwise have been made explicit. This is the control room. Any movie that shows us a control room is tipping its hand broadly. Things are soon going to be very badly out of control. This highly designed system is hubris on screen, and we're all going to see what happens when something unanticipated occurs. The intel is wrong. The monster is impervious to our weapons. The enemy agent has spotted the surveillance team. The control room is a monument to the planning, systems, routines, processes, and procedures that lead to success, but its brittleness is revealed when what's required is improvisation. 
The control room and its inhabitants sit safely in a bunker or a safe house or at headquarters. But the real action, which they watch semi-helplessly on those wall-sized video displays, is out in the field. If there is to be any success today, it will be because of a field team that rejects the naivete of the control room. Ironically, the bonus value of the kind of research that we're talking about here is, the, is in the things that you can't anticipate, the things that you'd never think to ask about, but you discover once you enter the context that you're interested in. The control room is predicated on the belief that you can anticipate and design for anything. But the lesson we take from the drama is that we will fail if we actually believe that. And of course, there's war stories about control or about the loss of control. In one of them, Diane Laviglio goes on site to speak with participants, and in the middle of the interview, their boss comes in and yells at the first participant to get out of there and go into another meeting. Then 10 minutes later, he comes back in and yells at the other participant. The researchers end up sitting in this conference room alone, and they show themselves out of this, out of this company. In another story, Ryan DeGorder has a manager along with him, and despite all of Ryan's preparation, the manager insists on aggressively interrogating their participant. Nicholas Nova is doing interviews in a fast food restaurant when a rather large and energetic person confronts them at their table and announces that he's just been released from prison and he's hungry. Here's a story from Elaine Fakuda. I admit, I don't have a lot of experience with children, but the opportunity to shadow a patient through an entire day's hospital visit was not one to pass up. The patient being 13 years old added another layer of consent and assent, a mythical ethnographic research unicorn of sorts. The goal of the shadowing was to understand the experience of the entire visit from start to finish, through multiple provider visits, labs, tests, and the waiting times in between. I met the patient and her mother as they were pulling into the parking garage, and they started the day with a scan. Having fasted since the previous evening, this participant, she was ready for lunch after the scan, but they wanted to get everything done before their provider visit, so she and her mother decided to get a blood test done before lunch. We arrived in the pediatrics department, and her mother stood in line to check in while I joined the patient in the waiting area. After a few minutes, a volunteer came over. He was an elderly man with a book cart. The patient shrugged and said there wasn't anything she liked. Determined, the volunteer took out a magical coloring book which colored itself with a flip of a page. She was still not impressed. Then came the pièce de résistance. From the cart, the volunteer pulled out a heavy woven rope and introduced the patient to his friend, Mr. Stick. Mr. Stick had a magical ability, you see. With a grand gesture, he could become taut. In order to turn back into a rope, the patient was instructed to ask, Mr. Stick, will you go down? The shade of red across the teen's face had long passed lobster, and she and I stared at each other in disbelief. Her mother was still in line across the way, and as the adult, I felt responsible but conflicted about what to do. Surely the man had no idea what he was implying. Being a very good sport, she complied, and sure enough, Mr. Stick fell limp. But the volunteer didn't stop there. He turned to me, holding the middle of Mr. Stick, now back in its rigid state. He asked me to tell Mr. Stick to go down, which I did. Nothing happened. The volunteer said, I must say please, which I did, and again, nothing happened. He then said, I guess Mr. Stick doesn't go down if you're not a child. Hey, I think they're calling your name, I said quickly to the patient, and with that, we escaped the creepy but well-intentioned volunteer. <laughs> and it wasn't until after the blood test and during lunch they were able to debrief and talk about this encounter with the volunteer, I was afraid her mother would be upset that I hadn't intervened sooner. She was shocked and laughed, wondering if someone could really be that clueless. As I started to explain what had happened, the patient, who had been sitting right next to the volunteer, interjected. No, its name was Mr. Stiff, not Mr. Stick. And that's the end of Elaine's story. <laughs> Elaine's story comes from a chapter about control. And here's what we can learn from her story specifically, and then more generally from stories that involve these challenges to control. It's okay to walk away, especially if you've tried everything. Sometimes circumstances prevent you from accomplishing your objective. But trying and failing can be illustrative, whether it's about participants and aspects of their culture, or about how your organization is perceived, or even about this particular research venture. If nothing else, it's a chance to have a laugh. 
knowing when to walk away from anything, not just an interview, is a real life skill, and it's not something that's easily codified. Call a timeout. When the interview feels almost completely out of control, take a step back and readjust. Now, one thing is you can take a pause. Give me a moment, please when you feel unsettled, but a timeout is something that's more extreme. Let's all take a break for a few minutes. Or use the breaks that you're given. When external circumstances disrupt your flow, use that as an opportunity to step back, to readjust, and to re-energize. The unexpected can reveal bold new truths. One of the prized and joyous aspects of working in the field is that things happen that you weren't expecting. But those are things that reveal powerful, something that's powerful that you wouldn't have ever imagined that you should go out and look for. Sometimes the unexpected is just a monkey wrench that you didn't ask for, such as the recently released and hungry prisoner. And you probably won't know which is which, even with experience. It's a reminder of the importance of staying open. And finally here, improvise. This is often as expressed as saying yes and to everything that comes your way. But in research, you have to be more selective about what you say yes to. When you're in the field, you can think about improvising as working from a script that's being created on the fly. Of course, improvised performances don't always proceed gracefully and sometimes come to an awkward halt. Improvisers don't consider that a failure, and neither should you. These awkward moments can happen despite doing everything right. If the script you start with falls flat, you can start creating a new script, pivoting to a different conversation. It's okay that these researchers messed up in some way. You probably have messed up. You probably will mess up. That's inevitable, and it's okay. And in no way am I suggesting that you do anything but your best work always, but rather I'm acknowledging the demands of reality. And there's a messy human reality at the core of research. That reality can sometimes exceed the level of your best work, and that's just the way it is. Digging into war stories, reflecting on your reaction to these stories, and discussing with others, it's a way to get past unhelpful self-recrimination and to continue learning the craft of research. You can have empathy for the storyteller, for the other people in the story, and for yourself. Failing sucks, but these war stories give you three different ways to overcome that. One, there are lessons from others' experiences that you can use to limit your failures. Two, there's a big stack of permission slips here for you to have inevitable failures. And three, it's a different way to think about what does it mean to learn from failure? <coughs> Crucially, if more elusively, these stories reveal the priceless data that comes out of being in the field, the elements that aren't findings, but are the ways in which we are personally and permanently changed. When you step outside of your comfort zone, you are heading out to war in a small but meaningful way and you're facing two stages of risk. The first from whatever unknown awaits you out there, and the second from the likelihood that you will return from the war forever changed. These war stories remind us of the humanity at the very root of user research. The people doing research are human, the people we want to learn from are human. And I use the word human to stand in for the many qualities that led to these stories. Emotional, vulnerable, unpredictable, flawed, ambitious, error-prone, insecure, curious, patient, judgmental, messy, anxious, persistent, reflective, thoughtful, and kind. These stories teach us that researchers are always learning to do research and that learning goes beyond a set of methods. We must grapple with ourselves as humans in a world of humans. We can and should share more stories about our work and how and when things go wrong. You probably have stories. Your colleagues have stories. Tell those stories. The more we share stories of failure, the more we normalize thoughtful and transparent consideration of our work. This growing group of storytellers has bravely and honestly shared their own experiences. And you don't have to feel alone with your mistakes. Instead, you can join their illustrious ranks. All it takes is a story. Another quote here from Brene Brown. Vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not weakness. It's our greatest measure of courage. Now we've got a treat. We're going to hear two stories told by the researchers who wrote them. So please welcome Nancy Frischberg. She's a UX researcher 
eager to tell stories with a few more great clients. And please also welcome Priya Sahoni. She studies people's behaviors for a living and loves collecting great field work stories to share. Somewhere in there, somewhere in there, Priya focuses on designing better stories, I'm sorry, designing better products and services for those people too. Hi there, great to see you. Well, I'm here to tell a story about a fieldwork experience where I was following a cohort of people, each of whom had the same autoimmune disorder, and I got to visit with them at home or in their work environment and go on one doctor visit with them. And I noticed on one of the home visits, the first visit to this particular person, uh, she showed me, very willing to show me through her home. We went into the kitchen, and it was a messy house. It looked lived in, just like everybody else's. We went into the kitchen, and there I noticed on top of the refrigerator were red sharps containers, at least two, maybe three or four. Have you seen those at the doctor's office? You know what I mean? The, it's where you put the, the needle after you've given yourself an injection, or the, do, the doctor puts the needle after they give you the injection. So these are to store medical waste. And I mentioned, and I noticed it, and I took pictures. I was taking pictures everywhere. Um, and uh, at another visit, I came in and I helped her set up her Christmas tree. She said, I really want to do this, and I haven't gotten around to it. I don't know if I can do it. And I thought, well, can I help her? Sure, why not? It's not going to cause me any difficulty. She'll tell me more about how the holidays are affected by her illness and so on. We'll be able to get deeper in if I do this. Good. We went into the garage one day, and I noticed on a table in the garage were six or eight, maybe a dozen more red sharps containers, all with used stuff in them. And I said, well, what do you do with those? And she said, you know, I've been meaning to take them in somewhere, maybe the doctor's office or something. I said, oh, so uh, what's stopping that? Well, now I've got so many of them, and I, you know, I, I just, and I work these long hours, and I don't know if they're open when I'm available, and so on. Okay. And at the last visit, when I came in, she said, you know, I've been thinking about those sharps. Can you take them away for me? So what would you do in that situation? If I say absolutely not, uh, that puts me in an odd situation of, you know, refusing her where I've been so open. If I say yes, that's even weirder because it changes my role with respect to her. I'm no longer the researcher from this outside organization. Now I'm a friend, now I'm a helper, now I'm some extension of her doctor. I don't know what I turn into, but whatever it was, I didn't want to turn into that. So I said, how about if we do it together? And that let me, you know, uh, relieve my anxiety about her having all that stuff in her house, but also her, and I thought if she started from a clean slate, maybe that would give her the courage and the ability to go and keep up with it now. I have no idea, I didn't follow up. But we did get in my car, put all the boxes in my car, took them to the pharmacy at the medical office where her doctor had an office. Nobody said a word. We didn't say whose they were, hers, mine, somebody else's. We're bringing in all these sharps. Good, we can take care of that for you. Good, I took her home. Bye. Now, I told this story to Steve, and Steve wisely asked me to make obvious to you what's obvious to me, and that was, he said, well, tell more about why you made that choice. And I said, you know, I used to work as a sign language interpreter for many years, and I wrote a book about that. And one of the nice things about that field was there was a very clear code of ethics you had to subscribe to if you're going to pick up this work. In, and it kind of can be summarized as reduce dependency, make sure people, you're not intervening with people to take over their lives and make decisions for them. There are several other points about confidentiality and so on. But I thought that was kind of my attitude coming to this situation. I did not want to increase dependency where she was always going to have to find somebody outside to take the stuff away for her. But I didn't want to leave her in the lurch either. And I felt like that was some kind of middle ground. Now, I don't think in experience design we have an overt code of ethics. People who've studied anthropology probably have read the American 
Anthropological Association's code. People who've studied computer science may subscribe to the code that's put forward by the Association for Computing Machinery for software engineers. And so I think any of those codes will help give you guidance as you're stuck making these odd decisions and having to improvise. But uh, that's where I drew my strength from. Awesome. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Priya. Um, thank you, Steve, for the opportunity to write in um, your book. And I saw a lot of you taking notes from the slides. And if you haven't picked up Steve's book yet, it is really, really <laughs> amazing. No, shameless plug. But, uh, um, no, just the way the, the, the nature of the content and the, the way the stories are laid out, it makes for um, a really good binge read. That's, that's what I did with the book. Um, anyway, I'm an ethnographic researcher and a user, um, user researcher, uh, and I've been doing this for uh, quite a few years, and um, I came to this country as an immigrant in 2002, and if it weren't for this profession, I probably would not have had a chance to go out and meet, um, you know, this diverse group of people um, that I get to interview, you know, all over the country and outside the world and would not have changed my perspective um, the way it has today. So anyway, back to my story. Um, so my story takes place in um, October of 2010. Um, I was doing research in a hospital in the San Francisco Bay Area. And at the time, I was about eight months pregnant with my first child. And um, hospitals are not like my favorite environment to do research in because I just get so queasy and the, the smells and you know just all those like beeping sounds and stuff. And I always pass out normally in hospitals, but um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but I was given um, the choice. I could have either uh, done research in an ICU or the emergency or the maternity. And I chose maternity, obviously, because I was so excited to be with you know, all the other women like me who were about to pop. And anyway, so it was all going good, and um, it didn't even feel like a hospital environment. And um, on one of the shadowing sessions, I got to sit in on a nurse shift change. So the outgoing shift of nurses was uh, sharing information about the patients that they were caring for to the incoming shift of nurses, and everyone was taking notes and you know, paying a lot of attention. And um, on one of the nurse's turns, she um, looked over to the nurse manager, and she opened her, um, her notebook, and she started reading out. Um, she said, uh, baby girl in room 203, uh, born vaginally at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, she uh, had difficulty breathing, and she survived for 53 seconds and then uh, passed. Should I register this as a live birth or a stillbirth? And... Um, I felt like someone had stabbed me in my stomach. I mean, I was pregnant with, and in just over a month, I was expecting a baby girl too, and I um, had so much pain, I had to, like clenched my tummy and I was down on the floor. I was literally having like a biological reaction to, to hearing what the nurse had just said. And um, I thought to myself, like, how can this nurse be so unemotional about a baby's death, right? And sitting there on the floor, I was in tears, and the nurse manager turned around and um, noticed me crying, and she came over and apologized um, that I had to sit through that and, and um, asked me if I wanted to take a, a little break you know, from, from work. So, um, but I decided I just wanted to stick around and see what happened and continue working. So um, the, nurse, uh, the shift change was done, and uh, the nurses dispersed, and I continued shadowing this nurse from 203. So then she, she walked out of the shift change, and she went to another room where... Um, uh, a perfectly healthy baby girl was born, and she was in fine condition. She walked in with a big smile on her face and congratulated the parents, and she picked up the baby girl and, and changed her and swaddled her, and she's rocking her in her arms, and, you know, the whole time, like, um, sharing information to the new parents on how to care for their newborn, and, um, you know, and then the, the baby had fallen asleep, and she um, just handed the baby over to, to her daddy. And um, I was standing there observing this nurse, and, um, you know, that kind of moment, it struck me that this nurse that I had just like a few moments ago dismissed as sort of being unemotional, she actually was deeply, deeply concerned about her patients. And when she was in room 203, she had felt that pain that the family had been through and she had shared their sorrow, but at the same time she had made this commitment to hundreds of other patients to take care of them and be with them in their moment. And there was no way she could carry that sorrow out of 203 into these other patients rooms and into their lives as well um, and I totally went home that day with sort of this new admiration and respect for um, for this nursing profession and um, 
that story, that incident, it stayed with me for several days after it had happened. And um, um, I just thought, like, as, as researchers, as ethnographers, we're trained to um, uh, just empathize with our respondents. And um, I felt like where I had failed that day, I had seen this nurse really carrying out, you know, all of her roles with so much empathy for all the people that she was um, serving that day, you know. And um, if you read the the chapter in Steve's book, you know, it kind of explains that. I mean, we are, we're human beings, right? We feel these feelings, but we're um, it's up to us to train ourselves to to not let our um, feelings, our emotions, sort of dictate our inferences from what we're um, seeing and learning. So, anyway, that's my story. Thanks, guys. Thanks. We have uh, a couple minutes for questions. You wanna, are you going to run a mic? I don't know. Questions, comments, thoughts in the back I'm there? I'm run the mic out so that to actually run. questions get recorded as well. Ideally, the next question would be in the front row, probably in the other corner. Hi. So thank you for your talk. Um, oh, was somebody else asking? Sorry. Oh, all right. Go ahead. Um, so my question is that this is something I've struggled with as a researcher, is that I understand research as like I am going into a community because I want some information out of that community, but oftentimes I've seen that just the act of doing research can have certain impacts, like long-lasting impacts on the community itself. So is that something, I mean, I've not read your book and I will probably read it, but is that something like you've addressed or is, like what are your thoughts on that? I mean, what's the what's the principle from physics that you if you observe something you change it? Heisenberg. Is that Heisenberg? Right, right. So I, I mean, I think that's we sort of know that to be true from any kind of observation. Um, I mean, I, I think it puts an interesting ethical question on you, um, which I think comes up for any time we do this: is what we're doing, is what we're doing good for the people that we're doing it with? Um, because uh, I think there's two aspects to it. Well, even more, like the experience we're having with someone. Uh, I talk in the book a little bit about uh, interviews where I get people to cry and where I like to, I like that. And it's not because I like to be, what? Not because, <laughs> not because I'm doing something injurious to them, but uh, a conversation about something as benign as wine labels can lead people to reflect very deeply on things that they have emotions about, and they share those with me. Um, and so, so you might look at that and say, oh, Steve made someone cry, or you could say, oh, Steve facilitated uh, something that was sort of emotional and meaningful for somebody, and there was a connection made. So I think there's like, what do we do with them in the moment that we're with them? Is that good for them? Um, and then what are the consequences of that? Um, and so you've sort of added one to me for that. I think about the consequences as we're going to go off and make something or change something or build something that's going to come back and bring value to them, and that's why we want to learn from them. But I think you're talking about something in between, like what is just the experience of doing the research change in that environment, and is that positive or negative? Am I... So I've especially seen this in vulnerable populations, like just the fact of me going there and asking yep. certain questions and me starting a conversation that might be uncomfortable for people is changing something within the people I'm talking to. And then it obviously, like they're not blind to it. They will go and talk to somebody else about it and that there's a domino effect to right. that. They could could be a negative domino effect of that. So I, I was just curious what your yeah. thoughts on that were. I mean, we have this idea of informed consent, right? That, but... Um, there's a great article that I uh, somebody wrote about uh, on Medium. I can't I can't like riff off the URL, but I like I put it on my uh, if you, I put it on my Facebook page, and if you look at the Portugal uh, LinkedIn page, or if someone wants to find it and tweet it right now, it was like uh, it was a re, sort of a reinvestigation of informed consent and how um, you know we sort of are treating it in research as a bit of paperwork, and I'm definitely guilty of this, and so. He talked about informed consent as um, more of a conversation, and, and that there's things that you say to them, not to alarm them or be silly about it, but to help them, to facilitate them doing the act, the act of being informed and giving consent. Um, 
And I think that's hard, and I think I don't always think about that part of it. I got my legal paperwork covered, I'm kind of going in there. I'm not going to be a jerk to them, even though you think I make people cry now. Um, but I have, I'm not taking it as far, so I don't have an answer for you. I think, I'll just say, you raised a really good question. I think there's a whole sort of, there's a lot for us to continue to think and talk about it, and you put it really well, and thank you. Do we have one uh, more? It's, it's noon if people want to run to lunch, but I'm okay. happy to keep handing the mic around as long as people want to talk. You're released, or you can keep asking questions. Um, thank you. So a lot of this feels like this war is about some of our own implicit internal biases. When you're chronicling these war stories, how do you keep the story from being centered on our own biases versus the people that are actually affected by it? I mean, it's, hmm. I don't know that I'm trying to. I mean, you know, Nancy's story sits right next to someone who um, goes to an interview. The woman is locked out of her house. The woman decides to break a window with glass, and they're like, no, you don't have to do that. She breaks the, the front window, and the researchers decide to vacuum and clean up all the broken glass. Sort of, they made basically the opposite choice of, of what Nancy described. Um, and I like that the stories show people confronting situations and making a choice. Um, and I don't think, I don't. Yeah. Right. And you know, I think there's bad reasons to choose each one and the positive Yeah. So you so to me the stories are about the it's a body of stories. Um, and so like the book was meant to sort of group them so that you can look at them and reflect on them, but there's no I don't a lot of this is about there's not really a right thing. I think people do have biases. You, and you can read these stories and judge them. Um, and I think that's an important way to learn. So you may read a story X and say like, Nancy's crazy, I would totally have just picked that stuff up. Um, and I realize we're talking about different kinds of biases. It's really the set of choices that people make and what they, how aware they are of what those choices are. And so you can read these stories. Um, there's one about a researcher that um, was on her first visit out in the field and the place was quite chaotic and her more experienced uh, colleagues were kind of, they were kind of snarky when they came out. And she got very, you can just imagine a young person very self-righteous and said, well, this is, this was valuable and you have to respect people. And so the story is about her kind of, um, you know, speaking up for what she values. So you can read it that way and think like, yeah, you go. Or you can read it as like, you're 22 and you don't understand how the world is and your point is valid but it's overstated because of right. your youth. So I think you can read all of these and see that that researcher didn't fully acknowledge their choices or didn't fully express their biases. And so that delta between you as the reader and that storyteller, I think that's wh where I think these stories have an additional level of value. It's not just, hey, Nancy says this or Priya learned this lesson. Like, what do we learn from reading them? And that, I think, is just more scattered and generative. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, like follow-up. I might have dodged like your question. It seems like a starting point. Like, it's one part of the whole experience if you're trying to build a holistic view of what one person's experience you're biased towards or what you think it's, it is. It almost feels like it's a starting point, but it's not the full story in a way, almost. Like, it'd be very interesting if there was another side of this that included the people that were the the almost the objects of the bias and they had their perspective of yep. what it was it almost seems like this is a starting point but not a final in the book place. is a and it's actually it's um if you if you look at there's a free discussion guide that you could use with the book or that you could use with any war story and it's meant to, to provoke that like what do you think happened in this story what experiences have you had um Right, so you put it in a book, you sort of commit to a set of things. Even just watching you guys tell the stories, which I've only read, I've never heard you kind of talk through them, like other things start to come out. Um, and so stories are, they're fake, right? They're just a, a representation of an experience in hindsight. Um, so they are not true, and my interpretation or judgment of that story isn't any more true. And, yours, and if we talk about it and start to unpack it and compare and contrast Sharon Cartwright's broken glass with your broken sharps, like, we start to think about more things that I think are, that's the learning that I see these stories can generate. So, yeah, here's like Steve's 12 takeaways about this and that, 
and that gets us here. But I think the growth is exactly what you're talking about, that starting point. Um, thanks so much, Steve, and to Nancy and Priya. I'm going to let everybody go to lunch. Uh, back here, 115. Thank you.